Okay, this is a lecture for my uh, seventh hour class on the 20th of April. Uh, remember, listen, remember the a couple of things. Tomorrow you have a test, and where did we say that test would begin? Uh, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Thank you, Woodrow Wilson. And the other thing is, uh, remember that if you are ever gone, if you were gone right now, it's your responsibility to watch the lecture when you get home from whatever it is you're doing and come in here and take the exam tomorrow. We're simply running out of days. However, if you have an extenuating circumstance where you've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow and you're not in school, uh, that has, that's, that will be made up the next Wednesday after school. We're limiting the time for makeup tests, okay? So uh, make sure you keep all that in mind. That's We all got responsibilities here, and that's a couple of years. Anyway, I want to go on. When we were talking yesterday, we were talking about why when the war broke out, the United States, even though it's going to be a neutral country, Woodrow Wilson said right off the bat, we're going to remain neutral, which we didn't. Uh, it took us three years to get into the war, but eventually the United States will get into the war. But why we, even though we were neutral, why did we favor the Allied nations? Well, of course, France had been our first ally. We would have never won the Revolutionary War without the French. The French were fighting along with the British against the Germans. And of course, uh, our English heritage is part of our heritage. It's not the only U.S. heritage, but part of it. We speak the English language, English common law. You know, our history uh, has an English section to it. The Mayflower, the Pilgrims, Jamestown, and so on. Uh, the Revolutionary War. You know, uh, England, uh, we have a, a huge cultural tie to the British. It's not the only cultural tie. We have cultural ties all over the world, but England uh, is a huge cultural tie. So because of that, we felt much closer to the British than we did the Germans and the Austrians. And again, the United States is not in the war, but the opinion of the United States is we are, you know, hope that the most people, again, there are 15 million Germans who believe the Germans ought to win the war. And a lot of those young Germans here in the United States, even though they were born here, we're in 1914, even though their families have been here since the 1840s, a lot of them are going to leave here and go fight in the German army, okay? And even in World War II, there are young Germans. 20 years later, after World War I, there are young Germans born and raised in America, never knew any country except this country, and they're going to go to Europe and they're going to join with Hitler and they're going to fight in Hitler's army. And I do want to remind you that the German army of World War I is much, much different than the German army of World War II. You're talking about a difference of night and day. If the German army in World War I had won this war, uh, the, the peace settlement would have been about the same. A civilization would have buried their dead and they would have gone on, just like they did with the British and the French and the Americans and the Italians and the Russians won. But if Hitler had won, if, if the Germans of World War II had won World War II, uh, I don't possess the eloquence, the knowledge, or the ability to adequately explain to you how radically different the world would be. And I'm not talking about ra radically different in a good sense. I'm talking about uh, it would be monstrous to live on this planet if Hitler and the Nazis had won. So you bear that in your mind. When I'm saying the Germans, I'm not talking about Hitler in World War I. I'm not talking about Hitler. Entirely different kettle of fish. Another reason we supported the Allies was the invasion of Belgium. And they executed a British Army nurse, uh, and they killed thousands of Belgians, and they burned their towns. And then, of course, finally, the war was good for the U.S. economy. Did we do that yesterday? Okay, yeah. We're, we're the only country that makes a profit off the war. And when the war is over, we enter into the 20s, the 1920s, the greatest period of economic expansion up until that point. We've had greater periods since then, but up until that point. So for all those reasons, the United States supported the Allies. They wanted the Allies to win the war. Meanwhile, on the Western Front out here, get this down. Meanwhile, on the Western Front, the war in 1914-1915, that's what we're going to look at now, 1914-1915, turned into a bloody stalemate. That means stalemate means neither side was winning. The war turns into a bloody stalemate. Millions, millions of people are dying, but nobody's winning. Nobody's getting the advantage. It's trench warfare. I want you to write that down. You know, uh, this is not the only war in which there are trenches. And by the way, when I, I'm going to show you a little film clip from a movie in a moment. 
uh, and you can really get, they did a really good job in recreating what World War I trenches looked like. But I'm not just talking about a little hole in the ground. These trenches extended for miles. Some of them were 40 feet deep. 40 feet, that's deeper than this building you're in is tall. You had to have a ladder to get in and out of them. They were, they were as wide as from here to the middle of this room or even beyond that. The sides were stacked with sandbags. Uh, there were underground command posts. There were underground barracks. There were underground kitchens. There were uh, underground ammunition depots. Uh, both these armies on the Western Front, if I can find the map, and I probably won't be able to, but both these, yeah, both these armies, once the fighting stops uh, the invasion, once the Battle of the Marne is fought and the French stop the German invasion, they both settle in here, and that's where they're going to be for the next four years. Both sides go underground, and people, uh, soldiers live like gophers underground. Uh, here's what I'm talking about right here. There's the front line of one trench, but here's the front line. You had the front line troops here, and then these trenches, uh, it wasn't just one front line. They were extended back maybe as far as 20 miles. It was a situation, I think I can show you better on the board. Here is the front line of the German trenches. Here's the front line of the British trenches. Uh, and uh, you got the front line troops here, and then that's connected to a trench, and there are reinforcements there. And that's connected to a trench, and there's artillery there. And that's connected to a trench, and there are kitchens there to carry food up to the men on the front lines. And then that's connected to a hospital trench, and that's connected to an ammunition trench, and on and on it goes. So you don't just have the front line. These trenches extended 20 miles uh, in, in every direction, and that sort of shows that. Uh, there's a trench, okay, there's one. That's a British trench. Those are British soldiers. You can tell by uh, their helmets. Uh, there's some men going over the top. You had to have a ladder to get in and get out. And uh, the way the war was fought, by the way, this uh, in front of the trenches. Did I show you this the other day? Yeah, got, the, the, got this. They're big scro scrolls of barbed wire. It's not the barbed wire you used to. It's not the barbed wire you've got around your 40 acres had barbs that long, and they were razor sharp. If you fell into them, it cut you, sliced you up like a stick of baloney. Uh, one of the most dangerous jobs in the war. If this side is going to attack over here, they had guys with huge wire cutters. That's the most dangerous job maybe I think in World War I. You had to go out in front of the troops, cutting the wire so the troops could get through without cutting themselves to pieces. This area right here is called no man's land, okay? No man's land. And you can look across and see the enemy. And for weeks and weeks, this is the way the war is going to be fought on the Western Front. For weeks and weeks and weeks, nothing happened. You know, the men who go, people who go to war will tell you one of the biggest enemies is boredom. It's kind of like being in prison. People, a lot of people who go to prison write about their experience or they are interviewed and they say, what's the worst thing about it? You know, it's like so much time on your hands. You're just bored to death. Day after day, week after week, year after year, hour after hour. Well, it was the same way here. These men would be bored to insanity, and then all of a sudden, the artillery, the big guns, would open up, and they would bomb that trench. And they might bomb it for a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, I'm going to tell you about one battle that uh, they uh, landed uh, something like uh, 60,000 shells an hour for 24 hours on one section of the enemy lines. Uh, and they're going to rain that bombardment day after day, hour after hour, and all of a sudden, just as suddenly as it began, it will stop, and there's absolute silence. And these men crawl out of their bunkers, and they get ready because they know an attack is coming. Uh, and they man their positions here, and all of a sudden, you I'm going to show you a little movie version, but all of a sudden, you'll hear whistles. They've got these long trench whistles, they call them, and they'll blow that, uh, and you'll hear officers down here in these trenches yelling to their men, over the top. There's some men going over the top right there. That's an actual combat photo. It's not a bunch of actors. Uh, they'll go over the top, they'll line up, and they'll start across no man's land, and they get about halfway across, and uh, they'll be slaughtered. What, what, which weapon killed most of the 40 million? Four, listen, 40 million people died. Which weapon is it that kills most of the 40 million people that died in World War Well, this one in one grand. Huh? M1 Garand. What'd you say? M1 Garand. M1 Garand? Is that, is that a type of... It's a rifle. Oh, an M1 rifle? No, the M1s don't come into World War II. Oh. I, don't, I don't think. I don't think. I don't know that for sure. Here's the weapon. Well, this is what they do. 
There's some men going through the barbed wire. There's a trench. Shows you. There's some dead Germans. Uh, they probably were hit by an artillery round. Their shovels right there. They were probably reinforcing their trench. Something else that picture shows you is that it rained on the Western Front. Those men stood in mud for four years. And the mud will eventually seep through their leather boots. And they got a condition called trench foot. If you get trench foot, your foot swells up that big, bigger than football. And there's no cure for it. They chop your feet off. That's it. Today, there might be a cure for it, but in that, So that's why in Vienna, Austria, Berlin, Germany, uh, Paris, France, London, England, after the war, all the major capitals of Europe, you would see young men, not much older than you, uh, 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, and they were standing on a corner with a cup in front of them begging because their feet were gone. Okay, they lost their feet in the war. Not, you know, shot off just day after day standing in the trenches. But, uh, and by, by the way, they're in the trenches today. Okay, that's what's left. You know, this war was 110 years ago. That's what, to, to show you how deep and powerful and prevalent these trenches were. There they are, right there, and there are a group of tourists going through them. And if you go over there and you're walking through those trenches, be very, very careful because hardly a decade passes by. That some innocent tourists walking along and those says, puts their foot in the wrong place and it hits a shell that nobody knew existed there uh, and they it blows up and it kills them. Okay, uh, at the Battle of Verdun, and that's just one battle, they fired 40 million shells. 40 million at one battle. Okay, a lot of those shells didn't. There. Some of those shells didn't explode. They burned down in the ground. Over time, they've been covered up. It'll rain and wash it off, and you'll accidentally hit that. But there's some, the trenches of World War One haven't gone away. They're still there. That's the number one killer right there, right down the machine gun. That's a water-cooled machine gun. That's the number one killer. Most of the people who died in World War One were killed with a machine gun. It's a brand new weapon of mass destruction. It comes right out of the Industrial Revolution. So they'll get about halfway across, and the Germans will open up with their machine guns, and they'll kill them, slaughter them. None of these men reach the German lines. They don't have time to remove the bodies. The bodies lay there by the thousands. And when I talk about the machine gun at the Battle of the Somme, we're going to talk a little bit about that at the Battle of the Somme to show you how deadly the machine gun was. There were 85, the, 85 British soldiers were shot down by machine guns every one second. There's 85 dead, 85 dead, 85 dead, 85 shot down every second during the Battle of the Somme, okay, uh, by, by the machine gun. And none of these, and, and they can't remove the bodies. The bodies stock, stack up up there, stack up out there in no man's land. They rot. The smell must have been absolutely horrible. A new race of rats, that long, hairless rats will develop out there, and they eat bodies for four years, okay? And the bodies rot into the soil. And in northern France and in Belgium, this is where... By the way, write this down. Most of the fighting is in France. The nation that suffers the most destruction, if you don't have this, we might already have it. Most of the destruction is in France. The nation that suffered the most destruction, I think, is France. And for years after World War I, French farmers produced the uh, greatest, uh, great harvest that they'd ever had. You know why? Because their soil is fertilized with what? Yeah. Human flesh. Yeah, so you know, be careful you what your wine you drink. That you might be drinking old Uncle Ned, uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, and and uh, you know, they're thrown back in the trenches, and then a week or two later, the Germans will start shelling them. The Germans will cr come across and they'll be slaughtered, and that's what they did on the Western Front just back and forth. And neither side gained the advantage, okay? Uh, it's it's a slaughter, uh, it's a bloodbath. Uh, at first, though, they didn't have any fear. At first, they thought, you know, they, they didn't know, they, they didn't understand how the weaponry of warfare had changed. Now, there was a British regiment at the Battle of the Somme. We're going to talk about that, but there was a British regiment, and they got up out of the trenches over the top. They come up out of the, over the top, and they're all standing there in line. They're about to go across no man's land into these machine guns. Uh, and uh, they, you know, the, the national sport of England is football, although their kind of football we call soccer. Uh, and uh, just to show how little they feared the Germans, uh, they kicked the soccer ball back between the ranks as they went across, and they get about halfway across, and they're slaughtered. 
Some British officers, to show how little they feared the Germans, they refused to carry a weapon. They just carried a walking stick. They are out in front of their troops in pure clear view, and they step off, and of course, they're going to be shot to pieces. Uh, that's, uh, that's what happens. That's what happens on the Western Front. They were completely unprepared for the weapons of mass destruction uh, that they were facing. Get this down. This is the first gas war, too. And by the way, the last gas war. Gas proves to be, listen, gas proves to be so deadly that when the war is over, the nations of the world meet in Geneva, Switzerland, and they outlaw it. Hitler didn't even use gas uh, in combat. He used it to murder Jews, but Hitler didn't use gas in combat. Uh, they accused, the, the only person that I know since World War I, the only nation that I know that has used gas in combat, shooting at soldiers and killing them, uh, they accused Saddam Hussein in 1991 during Operation Desert Storm of gassing, using gas in his weaponry to kill Americans. Uh, I guess the debate's still going on about that. But there were two types of gas. One is mustard gas. And if you're running along and you inhale mustard gas, it'll feel like someone has their hands around your throat and they are choking you to death. People engulfed with mustard gas would grab their throats or choking to death and fall down dead. The second is chlorine gas. And chlorine gas, you know, you're young, you're healthy, your lungs are probably as healthy as they're ever going to be in your life right now. But if you got a good whiff of chlorine gas, uh, your lungs, in a matter of minutes, in a matter of minutes, would look like they had been uh, placed on a barbecue grill and cooked half a day. That's what it does to you. It kills you. Adolf Hitler was a young soldier in World War I. He was a corporal, and he had a very, in the German army, he had a very dangerous job. He ran messages from trench to trench. That was pretty dangerous. Uh, and just a few weeks, you know, three or four weeks before the war ends, he's running a message to another trench. And uh, you know, the way they fired these gas canisters is that they would, they would or gas, they'd put it in canisters and fire it out of a cannon. And that canister would hit on the ground and skid along and bounce like a pebble going across the pump, okay? But eventually it would stop and it would start hissing out this grayish green gas, okay? And Hitler's running along and one of those canisters lands nearby him. Uh, and he's overcome with the gas, and he faints. And if three more minutes would have passed by, you'd have never heard of Hitler. He wouldn't have been a footnote in history, okay? But another German runner comes along, and he had, been, he had uh, uh, managed to put his gas mask on, and he grabs Hitler, and he dragged him to safety. And Hitler ended World War I in a German hospital, recovering from this being gassed. But he never got over it. You can watch film clips of Hitler. If you take American History II and we're doing World War II, uh, you see a film clip of Hitler making a speech, and he, he occasionally stops and <laughs> coughs. Well, that's not because his allergies are acting up. That is because he suffered permanent lung damage in World War I from being, from being gassed, okay? Uh, so, anyway, uh, mustard gas and, uh, let me see here, well, let's go back. Mustard gas, uh, yeah, and, and of course, because of this gas, eventually they're going to issue everybody... Uh, Gas masks, even mules, those are American soldiers there. In fact, get this down, the first <laughs> gas used in history, the first gas used in warfare, I guess I should say, took place, uh, you know, and I'm not going to discuss a lot of World War I battles, but I'm going to put the names up here so that if in your future endeavors you ever encounter um, the names of these World War I battles, you're, you'll know they were fought in World War I, not in the the Vietnam War, but at a battle called Ypres in Belgium, okay, uh, the Germans were the first to use gas. They were attacking, listen, the Germans were attacking the British lines, and of course, you know, England, you know England had this great empire, and when the war starts out, all these people in this empire send soldiers to fight the British army, and there happened to be a group of Canadian soldiers holding a part of the British line. And all of a sudden, they see these gas canisters landing and hitting them. They don't know what they are. They just hit and bounce, but they start hissing out this grayish green gas. And they look and they see that their forward troops are grabbing their throats and falling down dead. And they don't know what it is. Well, there was an officer there, and apparently he had uh, paid attention in chemistry class because he took his handkerchief out. This is a Canadian officer. 
this gas is coming toward him, and he knows what it is. He took his handkerchief out and he peed on it. Human urine has ammonia in it. And he peed in his handkerchief and put it over his nose like that, and it enabled him to escape, to get away. And I'm sure there were a lot of people that, that followed suit, a lot of those Canadian soldiers that peed their handkerchiefs, and they lived. After that, everybody going off to the front, they're going to be issued a uh, they're going to be issued a gas mask. So gas is one of the great uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And by the way, this is a famous painting. And I think it's in the Imperial War Museum in London. It's called Gas. It's by a man named John Singer Sargent. And it's a group, there you see another uh, danger of gas is it blinded you. And there you see a bunch of young soldiers walking back. They're blinded. Here's some laying on the ground. They've got their eyes bandaged. And they're uh, walking back. And there's a man who still has his sight, who's sort of guiding, whoops, who's sort of uh, guiding them on their way. This is never going to work. Well, this is fun. Anyway, he's sort of guiding them on their his way, in a way. There we go. And uh, back to the station where they can get aid. But again, thousands and thousands of people are going to be blinded uh, by gas. Also write this down, airplanes. This is the first airplane war. We're talking about the weapons of mass destruction in World War I. It's an airplane war, and there's the British plane, okay? You can see their biplanes, their double wingers, okay, double wingers. The pilots, you know, this is brand new. Look, the Wright brothers flew in, the first people to fly flew in 1903, and 11 years later, this becomes the first air war. This was a new weapon. There were a lot of kinks to be worked out. One of the big problems, uh, you know, these are prop jobs. You know, they've got a propeller. They've got a propeller on them, okay? That's not, well, that's a replica of a World War I plane. Red Baron Pizza. Any of you eat Red Baron Pizza? Anybody? Is it any good? Anyway, well, anyway, you just eat it. You don't know if it's good or not. Anyway, it's got a propeller on it, and uh, they have, you know, machine guns. And, uh, you know, at first that looked just fine, but here goes an enemy plane, and you're zeroing in on that enemy plane, and you're going to shoot it down. Uh, your, your machine gun had to be synchronized with that blade. You understand that? The bullets have to go between the blades. If they don't, what happens? You shoot your own plane down. And that happened. The guy's coming in, and he fired and shot his own propeller off and crashed to the ground. So they had to go back to the drawing board, and they had to figure out how to synchronize those, but they did. Uh, the Red Baron Pizza, if you buy, I ought to have a picture of a box of it up here. I've never eaten it, but I see it at the store. Uh, it's named after a real life figure that fought in World War I. That's not just some figment of some uh, advertising agency's imagination. Uh, there was a Red Baron. Write this down. The Red Baron. He's the most famous pilot of World War I. He was a German. Here he is. Write him down. Baron von Richthofen. Baron von Richthofen. He is a World War I pilot. German. He's only 25 years old. Yeah. You know, if you shot down 21 enemy planes, 21 enemy planes, you became an ace. And everybody, every pilot in the war wanted to be an ace. 21 planes. He shot down 80. Four times what it took to be an ace. Like I say, these pilots were the most heroic figures of the war. They were like astronauts today who walk on the moon. And they wore these leather caps. If you look at that if you've eaten that Red Baron pizza, look at the pizza box, and there's a guy on there. He's got a leather cap on, a scarf around his neck, and their girlfriends and wives and sweethearts used to make scarves for them, and they put it on, and they put on that leather cap, and they could take off in that plane, and the world was just amazed at what they did. Like I say, they're some of the most heroic figures of the war. They fought duels against one another. You know, here would be the the German trenches, and here would be the British trenches. You know, and, and by the way, not a lot of people could fly at that point. Well, not a lot of people are pilots today, but a lot, not a lot of people could fly. Uh, and so they sort of knew each other before the war. And a German pilot would know that a British pilot was on the other side that he had met before the war. He would send a message to the lines and say, tomorrow I'm going to be out over no man's land at 11 o'clock. I challenge you to do it. And both planes would take off and they would meet. And no, they're not flying much higher, not much higher, usually than the lights on the football field there. And they would fly out and they would fly around with pistols shooting at each other, okay? 
And the troops would come up out of the trenches and stand there, you know, and cheer. For, it would look like the British guy was winning. The British would cheer. The Germans, the Germans would cheer. Eventually, I guess, they would either shoot until they got tired or one kill the other. Um, the, uh, they carried bombs, not under the plane, or they carried bombs in a basket in their laps. And they flew around and they would see a trench, you know, or something they wanted to bomb. They would simply pull their hand out and drop it like that. And that tended to irritate those soldiers down in the trenches. They're not flying very high. They're well within rifle range. And the guy would just pick up his rifle and shoot the pilot out of the sky. That happened quite often. That's what happened to him. At the end of the war, just a few weeks left in the war, and he knew that this side was losing. Germany was losing. And so he had shot down 80 enemy planes. I guess he wanted to go for 81. And he was going up the Somme River Valley, flying up the Somme River. And he saw a French pilot. And he comes in behind this French pilot, and he's going to shoot him down. And, and by the way, so everybody, the, the Red Baron, I left out the most important part. The reason he's called the Red Baron, he wanted everybody in any dogfight. That's when the two uh, air squadrons get a dogfight. That's what they called it. He wanted them to know that it was him. So he painted his entire, entire uh, plane red. That's where Red Baron comes from. And anyway, he's flying in this red plane, following this French plane. And there's an Australian soldier down in the trenches, and he sees it, and he knows who he is, and he simply raises his rifle and fired and shot him right through the chest, killed him. He's only 25, 24, 25 years old. The war would have been over in three weeks, but that's the end of the Red Baron. The United States had a great uh, hero. Write this man down. There he is in his plane. You can see his machine guns there, synchronized to his uh, propeller. Eddie Rickenbacker. There's Eddie. He shot down his 21 planes, and then they brought him around. They brought him back to the United States so he could, uh, so he could uh, go around the country and make speeches uh, trying to get people to identify the war or to uh, support the war, okay, and support the war. So Eddie Rickenbacker, he's the great, he's the great American hero. Manfred von Richthofen is the Red Baron, the most famous pilot of the war. So I hope by now, Okay, from what we've said so far, I hope by now that you can identify World War I by the weaponry. If you ever hear of a war, if you ever hear of these things put together, trench warfare, machine guns, mustard gas, over-the-top, flying aces, no man's land, barbed wire, uh, I hope you can see, you, no one has to tell you now we're going to talk about World War I, because all of those things are now just to the First World War. You know, the ferocity of this war took the world by surprise. The world has never seen a war like this. Let me just give you a quick illustration. At a battle call, write this down. Here's another World War I battle we're not going to talk about, but a battle called the Battle of Argonne Forest, okay? Ypres, the Marne, the Ypres, okay? Here's the battles, I think, the Ypres, the Marne, Argonne Forest, okay? At a battle called the Battle of Argonne Forest, in three hours, think about this, in three hours, they fired more ammunition than was fired in the entire Civil War. The Civil War lasted four years, killed 600,000 people. At the Battle of, at the battle of uh, Argonne Forest, in three hours, they fired more ammunition than had been fired in the entire Civil War. My point is this, the world, the world had, we'll stretch in a minute, the, war, the world had never seen a war like this, never in human history. Uh, and some of the worst battles uh, in human history are fought. I'm going to talk to you now about three of these battles. Write them down. Three of these battles, and I'm not going to say a lot about them, but I want to talk about them because I believe they're the worst battles of the war. Two of them are fought in July of 1916. One is the Battle of the Somme. This is the order we're going to do them in. One is the Battle of the Somme. The second one is the Battle of Verdun, which may be the bloodiest battle of World War I. And the third one is the Battle of Passchendaele. Okay? The Battle of Passchendaele. Okay? But just before I show you, talk about those battles, I want to show you. Have I shown you this little film clip of the trench warfare? Well, there's a short film clip. Have any of you seen the movie War Horse that came out of few years ago. Have you seen that? Once in a while they show it. Anyway, uh, here is the uh, 
here's what trench warfare was like. I think Hollywood does a you know, pretty good idea, does a pretty good job of showing you what the, the trenches and trench warfare was like. And uh, let's Turn out that light on there so we can probably see it a little better. Now, these I'm going to talk to you about the Bible of Psalms, and this is a, the Bible of Psalms according to uh, Hollywood. But, uh, and these are British soldiers, you can tell that by their helmets. I think the British Army still wears helmets like that. <laughs> See the trench? If any one of our boys comes running towards you, you take this light off and you shoot them dead. Do you understand? Do you understand? Do you understand? Tell me the He said the truth. Shoot them dead. Do you understand? Up there, son. Put your ladder. Put your ladder to your work. And come up for And you shoot British Army bagpipes, music to die by. So uh, that's the way the war, uh, that's the way the war was fought on the Western Front. 
and uh, back and forth they would go. And uh, of course, the slaughter was absolutely horrible, and neither side made any advance. Let's talk about the Battle of the Somme real quick. Can I take a break real quick? Quick, let me jump shot. Okay. Well, the Battle of the Somme. It's important to know all the following things about the Battle of the Somme. Number one, the Somme was fought uh, in July of 1916 through November of 1916. It's not just a one-day battle. The second thing about it, it's fought in Belgium. The Somme is a river the, in, the, in the Somme River Valley. Okay, And at this battle, it was the British versus the Germans, okay? So all that's important to know. And what you just saw there is essentially how the battle went. Here's what happened. I'm out of time, so I'm going to do this very quickly. Here's the German trenches. Here are the British trenches, okay? And uh, the British Army decided, uh, let's see here. I can find the map. It's all good. The British Army decided, and this is in 1916, the war is close to two years old, neither side has made any headway, so the British Army decides to blow a hole through the middle of the German lines and march to Berlin and win the war, okay? And so they open up, they pick out a, section, a, a segment of the German line, and they open up with their heavy artillery, and let me just, I got the story correct here, they uh, uh, bombarded the German lines for six straight, straight days, 24 hours a day. Uh, and on Saturday, July the 1st, 1916, what you just saw there, whistles began to blow. And the British Army came out of their trenches and lined up and got ready to go across no, man la no man's land. They were very confident that nobody was going to be hurt because they said, well, they have litter. There's no Germans left. They've blown a whole six hours, six days, 24 hours a day, raining shells down. There can't be a grasshopper alive over there. But what they did not know is that that bombardment, it collapsed the German trenches all right, but the trenches fell in on, on top of the German soldiers, and they were buried under the dirt and the timber, and they just sat there for six days almost perfectly safe while the bombs hit. You see what happened? And then when the bombing stops, they know what's coming. They hear those whistles blowing. They dig their way out. They dig their way out of the collapsed trenches, set their machine guns back up, and they're sitting there waiting. The British, this is when they kick the soccer ball. The British come across with bagpipes playing and flags flying and cheering and singing songs between the ranks, and they got about 150 yards out there, and the Germans opened up and get this down, killed 22,000 of them in the first day. That's the, that's the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army, and the British Army is a thousand years old. It killed, it killed 22,000 on the first day. This is the battle in which 85 men were hit by machine gun fire every second. 85 men slaughtered. And the British are going to be thrown back into their trenches, and what did they do the next day? They got up and did it again. And what did they do that and didn't break through? And what did they do the next day? They got up and did it again, just a second. They did it again and again and again. And finally, in November, they stopped. The British losses, get this down, were 450,000 men. And how far did the lines move? They did. I need to see Preston Letcher. Emily Beckham. 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 When you hear someone saying that World War I should have never been fought, when you hear someone saying World War I was a waste, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. And at the same time that the British are being slaughtered up here at the, in, the, in the Somme and making no progress at all, the Germans try to pack here at a French fort called Verdun. And when we come back after your exam tomorrow, we will take it up to the Battle of Verdun.
class called the military, your military class? Well, next year I'm going to be teaching American History 2. Uh, if you want to take, what you need to do is take American History 2. Gosh. Be glad to have you in there. We're going to start with World War II. Thank <laughs> you. 